All right. Amen. So, good morning. Palm Sunday. Amen. Now, in case you didn't know, when the Israelites were held captive by prophecy for 400 years, God sent him a deliverer, Moses. Now, Moses is a type of Christ. He's a deliverer. Isn't Jesus our deliverer? So he's a foreshadow. But Moses brought forth, as God commanded him, the law. And the law tells every human being, not just Jewish people, but every human being, that we cannot save ourselves. We need something more. Can you say amen? Now, I've had somebody say to me a long time ago, and I've heard it before. It says, oh, you Christians believe that Jesus is your, cr your, your crutch. And he said, no, Jesus is not my crutch. No, nope, he's not my Band-Aid. He's my stretcher because he's the only one that can carry us into heaven. Amen? And so Jesus is about ready to complete some prophecies as he's going into Jerusalem. Now, Jesus enters, goes to Bethany and enters Jerusalem many times before his crucifixion. And so we're going to see him enter twice, and I'm going to also tell about the fig tree. Are you ready to get there? our scriptures up and look at this. I love that backdrop. Easter. Yeah, wonderful job. All right. We're going to read Genesis 3.15 because this is the prophecy given to mankind about the seed of a woman that would crush Satan's authority. So that's what this prophecy, first prophecy of the birth and the finished work of Christ. And I will put enmity or division between you and the woman. He's talking to the devil. And between your seed, your offspring, your children, and her seed, her children. And he shall, notice it's a he, he shall bruise your head, crush your authority, and you shall bruise his heel. So we see the enemy chasing those he thought that were godly all through the Old Testament, killing kids and doing this during the time of Moses, trying to get rid of the one he thinks is going to crush his head. Well, he missed it. So Zechariah 9 verse 9 literally proclaims what Jesus is going to do. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, Israel. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. His very name means save, salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a fowl of a donkey. Isn't that beautiful? Here's our wonderful king. Here's our wonderful authoritative figure, the one who comes in like a lamb, riding on a donkey colt. This cult's never been written before. All right, so a couple of things I want to give her. We're going to cover these four areas, and I hope I just cause you to get into the Word of God. Amen. Number one, his humble and triumphant entry. It's both. Two, the lesson of the fig tree, what it means, what it means for Israel, what it means for us. Three, 
Jesus, his authority is questioned, just like prophesied. And fourthly, from Israel to the world. And this one here, I'll, I'll have to show you this one. Because how many here know Jesus came to save the whole world? God so loved the Now, let me kind of be gentle here. But the Israelites thought that they were the only ones that ever were going to be saved. Everybody else were too bad. Now, see, that's your concept. I'm not putting them down. But have you ever saw somebody that they think that they're the only ones that are going to be saved and everybody else they put down? Well, this was the religious problem of the day. So that when Jesus showed up, what did they do to him? They love him, embrace him like the scripture said? No, like the scripture said, they would crucify him. Now, what we know, but what the world doesn't know, is that is a trap. Our fathers set a trap to enslave Satan and finally get rid of him for eternity. Say amen. But right now, he's loose on the planet, and he's only working on those that will listen to him. So you and I need to be praying and asking God to seal us off so we don't hear the voice of a stranger. Say amen. I don't want to listen to him either. Amen. He's always reminding of us of our failures, right? He's always telling us what we should have been doing and couldn't. And if you hear that in your mind, that's him. That's not you. Okay? When you hear yourself call yourself an idiot, I'm using a, a graphic thing, that isn't you. That's him condemning you. Now, God said, I have come not to what? Condemn you, but to save you. Now, we need to get the idea. I was talking to Scott earlier before the service, and here's where I believe the church is missing it. Now, who am I to say, okay? But just listen to this. Everybody's concerned about the times in which we are living. Satan is a master at distraction. He's what I call sleight of hand. Look over here while I'm doing this over here. Look over here while I'm doing this over here. So you be careful when something looks too good to be true. Make sure there's something over here is not working underneath. Just be wise. Remember, you have God living on the inside of you. Say, I have God in me, and he alerts me. So let me encourage you at this time. There's an awareness and a keenness that God wants to bring you and I in. He said he will quicken our mortal body. The more time we spend with them and we find time to be with them, he quickens our body. You have a sixth sense that can sense when the enemy's near. Now, let me ask you real quickly. Have you ever felt ghost bumps? When something's scary, something about ready to alert, have you ever felt something go down your back and some shivers? That's your alert sense. God wants to get that back up in us so that we do not step in any traps and we're alerted before we get there. Say amen. That's good short for you. All right. So we're going to cover those four things. Do I need to say them again? No, you got them down. Got them memorized. Bless your heart. All right. So, all right. So we've read our paragraph. Let me say this to you. The whole purpose of you learning about this is learning how what sacrifice is really about. Jesus is preparing. He's looking over Jerusalem. He's weeping. He's looking over Jerusalem. He knows through the night he has to get up, get the colt, get everything going according to his father. So you've got to get that mindset. How are we? Do we get up in the morning and do we have a servitude mindset that we're willing to do whatever God asks us? Say amen, somebody. Yeah, that's what we really should. We should live in for God and trying to love other people with the power God gives us. Everyone say, no more going out than coming in. Because a lot of you are wonderful helpers. How many has ever uh, felt like you, you almost burned yourself out helping people? Don't raise your hand. That means you... You're doing it physically more than you are spiritually. Let God guide how to help, when to help, who to help, and why to help. Can you say amen? Did you get all those four? All right, amen. So we're going to get to this. So go with me to Mark chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 1. He, he was humble, but his triumphant entry, okay? Now I have to read this, and I'm learning to be a good reader, all right? <laughs> Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, 
to Bethanage, or Bethany, at the Mount of Olives. Remember I showed you a picture, Mount of Olives sits and looks at Jerusalem, and you see the eastern gate sitting there in the dome on the rock. Hello? That's the Mount of Olives. Bethany was just real close by. Okay? All right. So just so you know, and he said to them, go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which to one and, excuse me, let me read that again. Again, I'm not the best reader here. If you will find a colt tied to which no one has sat, loose it and bring it. And if anybody says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it. Now, let me just tell you, God probably already visited this man in a vision. Let him know that two disciples were going to come and get the colt. God is a gentleman. Can you say amen? So they don't have a skirmish, and the enemy doesn't use it. So remember, this is an encouragement for you and I. God sends himself forth into days ahead. Send your prayers forth about your family and your loved ones a couple days in the future. Start praying out in. Lord, I'm going to go two days in the future. I don't know what Piggy's going to be doing, but you do. I ask you to begin to arrange her. And Lord, as she steps into that time, and then Lord, all the way coming back to the present, bring her to a closer walk in you. Help everything she's missing to catch that you want her to catch. In Jesus' name. You see how wonderful and out of love we can pray for some. You didn't mind me using you and putting you on the spot. I ordered five bucks after the service. All right. <laughs> Are you with me? So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. Notice the donkey was outside on the street here. I'm ready for this. And as soon as those who stood there said to them, what are you doing? Loosing that colt. Guaranteed it wasn't the guy saying that. It was other people seeing that he's taken the colt. They were probably thinking, this is Carrie, I'm adding this. They were probably thinking, if nobody gets it, I'm going to take it. <laughs> just joking, moving right along. All right. And then, so they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded them, and they let him go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it. And they sat on, and he sat on it. And they spread their clothes in the road, and they cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And those that went before them and those who followed cried, saying, what? Hosanna. Now, this is a prophecy. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We sang a couple songs like that. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David, that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Now, remember, the Jewish people were thinking, this is our king, this is it, Rome's gone, we're going to take over the world. That's the mindset that they had. Now you know why everybody was so disappointed when Jesus gave himself up in the garden. On purpose. It's a trap to the devil. Jesus became a trap, not only sin, but became a trap for the devil so the devil would attack him without permission. Thinking that he was carrying sin so he could attack him. No, 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 no. He was carrying our sin. So actually when he attacked Jesus because he saw that he was having sin. The sin nature was on him. It's time to attack. How does the devil know when to attack you? When you're in the flesh. Too long more than you should. Amen. And he goes, it's time to attack. But see, inside that which he had carried on him, he was innocent. And when he did all that, bang, bang, he was bound, he was broken, and he was stripped of all the authority that he stole from Adam. So the only thing, now this is where people need to know, the only thing Satan has is the ability to con us. Remember, Jesus, the last words he said, if you're going to see the ends of the last days, you be careful that you be not deceived. How many times do you see the word deceived in there? I'm going to count them all up. 
The idea is that, remember, Satan's kingdom is a, a kingdom of deception. Why, Carrie? Because he has to deceive us into giving him the authority over us. Do you get that? I have to give him the keys to my house for him to get in. So what does he do? This is for fun because he tries it with me too. He jumps on somebody and they knock at the door and you say, come on in. Remember, you've got your house anointed so the spook has to stay outside. It's a joke. Laugh with me. Can you say amen? <laughs> Everyone say spooks outside, God inside. Amen. Get as much filled with God as you can because it, don't, you won't be concerned so much about the enemy. Why, Pastor Kerry? Because you'll be flooded with light you will have God's wisdom. Do you believe God is smarter than the devil? Come on, I'm asking you silly questions. Well, of course. Well, why do we act like God isn't? Step back and say, God, I need your wisdom for today. I've got a lot of things coming my way, jobs and good things, but I don't want the enemy coming in with the flood. So give me the wisdom that I need. Help me to do all things with the flow so that I operate in your command. I mean, you know, I'd rather pastor under God's command than jump out there and try to dazzle you with my charm. Can you say amen like so many others do? It's charming. And then when they get old, the congregation leaves because he's no longer charming. No, we don't entertain people in church. We give the word out. We point everybody as much to God as we can. Can you say amen? So my job is to pray for you and commend you to God so that you have a great relationship with him. Can you say amen? If I'm going to be guilty of anything, I want to be convicted of helping you love God more. Not making you feel guilty, not putting you down. Sometimes I say things that are pretty convicting, but, but everybody, you guys hold it well. You've you got a poker face. But I don't, the, I, the whole idea of any truth at all is we shall know it, and it shall set us free. Amen. Okay, here we go. So you can see the whole thing with the colt. So Hosanna in the highest. Now, verse 11. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. Notice where he went first, into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany. Remember, it's close to the Mount of Olives. What's he doing? He's going to go to the Father in prayer. He's going to ask for the next set of instructions. You mean Jesus is asking God to lay out the day? Exactly. How about you? Do you go to God every day and take just enough time for him to lay out your day? You know what you need to be doing. You know what you have to do. But let God lay out the day because you just might miss something on the way. Say amen, somebody. You love me? Look at this. couple points. Jesus was declaring who he was and what he will do when he enters in on the, on the cult. Two, people had no idea what Jesus was about to do. He was going to become the last sacrifice. No more sacrifices needed. I'm going to say something. Please don't write me a letter. But we got all these people waiting for Jerusalem to build a third temple, and they're collecting red heifers like you wouldn't believe. They've got manufacturers producing red heifers now. Okay? Well, listen, you and I are going to be gone if there's any reinstilling the sacrifice. But if you really read, I love Book of Revelations. In fact, I want to teach you that. Would you come to a special class if I did? All right. Amen. So, listen, think about it. It says that the Antichrist, or a man will go into the place declaring himself in the temple on the mount that he's the Antichrist. Say amen. But the problem is, there needs to be a temple there. And everybody just, they go, well, they can't even get the rights and all that to get on the temple, the mount and everything. You know, so about the time that they do it politically, it's going to be another 60, 30, 60 years. Don't get mad at me. But you know, there's a, a temple to the devil sitting already on the mount. It has a golden dome. Just pretty enough for the devil to walk into it, doesn't it? 
I'm going to prophesy. The Antichrist is not going to walk into a third built temple and all that rigmarole because everybody's stretching trying to figure out the truth. He's going to walk right in on the Dome of the Rock because it's blasphemy all around the Dome of the Rock, blaspheming Christ, blaspheming, and he's going to declare that he's the real Christ. That's called the abomination that maketh death out. And did you know the Dome of the Rock sits right over where the rock, and it's protruded out. I've been in there. It's protruded out in the middle of the floor where Abraham was going to offer Isaac. Hello? So, they built this demonic temple over the Dome of the Rock to keep Jesus from returning. Isn't that a joke? So right after the seven years of tribulation, I know we went on the side journey, Jesus is going to land on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split. There's going to be a great river run out of it, and he's going to march right through those two doors that you see sealed up because the Ottoman Empire sealed up those doors to keep Jesus from entering into Jerusalem again. He's just going to bash right on through it, and he's going to sit up the millennial reign. Now, I gave you a side journey real quick. Say, I got it. Guess what? Satan's lost, but he works on our ability either of our ignorance our fears, everyone say, no fear. God doesn't want me to fear. Why? Did you know fear's an attractor beam for the enemy? It actually is. Any time, you ever been to a scary movie? I happen to like monster movies sometimes. Don't tell anybody. And, that, and the scary thing, sometimes something will come out and you'll feel the, the goosebumps and all that. Now, I know some of you laugh and everything. That just make me a sinner. But what it taught me was the enemy has to breed fear for him to have power. So you'll notice that when you were a child, you had a several fearful things happen to you. Maybe somebody hurts you. And that's his trigger. Every time you get there, you, 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 you start to have apprehensional fear, which is a fear. And it attracts the enemy. No fear. No enemy. Perfect love casts out, for fear has torment. Hello? Are you with me? So we want to get as saturated with God as we can because God is love. Perfect love, perfect God casts out fear. Drive it out of you. Amen? It's like taking a shower in Jesus every morning. All right, so let's go on to my next point. All right. The lessons of the fig tree. In Mark 11, look at verse 12 through 14. Now the next day when they had come out of Bethany, he was hungry and seeing afar a fig tree having leaves. And he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Make a note of that. Nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Wow, what's going on? Now let me tell you something about a fig tree. I have one. Whenever you see leaves, there is already maturing fruit there. Okay? The fruit starts before the leaves. So when he saw leaves, Jesus know how he designed the fruit tree. There should be figs there. Now this is a type and shadow. Everyone say type and shadow. That means it's, it's, it's a clue to something else. Israel is the fig tree. And when you shall see the budding of the fig tree... You know the time is drawing near, Israel becoming a nation. So, always Israel's been the fig tree. This fig tree with leaves and no fruit, let me explain. Many, many Christians, many, many believers, they're all say leaves, but there's no fruit. Fruit is doing, leaves are hearing, watching, and saying, yeah, that's a good idea. They're agreeing. Now, listen, I'm not, I want to paint the picture. So when Jesus came to the fig tree, he, 
When he comes to, where is he going? He's going back to Jerusalem, isn't he? Going to clean out the temple. He's going to do a whole bunch of clean out. Why? Because Jerusalem was all leaves and no fruit. Didn't they kill Jesus? Now, here's the message to us. Don't be just all talk. Let's be walk. And we don't need to go any further than that because I, do, I don't want to be a condemning sounding. But don't tell God you're going to do something and not do it. That's what he means by that. Do it and then let God enjoy it. And you do. You guys are like that. But do you see the, the tree? So Jesus is going to pronounce a judgment, a wonderful judgment, actually. Why? Because now Jesus is going to leave the house of Israel where he's first to go to. See, preaching the gospel first to Israel and then to the rest of the world. Because they rejected Jesus, because they were all leaves and no fruit, Jesus went to the Gentiles. We're going to see that a little later on. All right? So let's get into this. Then he says, no, and then so a couple of points. Jesus is very purposeful in what he does every time. So this is Israel. He's saying they're all talk, no walk. It could be a message to us. So we want to make sure before your father, make sure that we get everything lined up and balanced. Say amen, and he'll, he'll help us. Two, a fig tree always should have fruit before the leaves mature. And when there are leaves, and there should be fruit, right? Yes. Okay, but it says, Pastor Curry, the time of fruit has not yet. That wasn't the point. The point was God made that trip tree do what it did to prove a point so that he could tell his disciples, look, guys, your heart is going to be pulled towards Israel because you're Jewish. But I'm not reaching to Israel only. I'm reaching to the whole world. My father sent me into the world to save people. He sent me to be the cure of, of terminal diseases that send us to hell. And... Everyone needs to have me in their heart. They don't need to be a religious person, but they need to have me in their heart and have a relationship so I can get them off the prison planet. Say prison planet. Read about the earth. It's beautiful. And God put it there for us to enjoy, but there's somebody imprisoned here. And he wants to put us in bondage too. So thank God we walk in the spirit. We live in the spirit. Say amen. Look at Mark. A little further down, Mark 11, verse 15 through 19. So when they came to Jerusalem, and then Jesus went into the temple. You see the fig tree first. Now he's in the, in the temple. And he drove out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone carry wares through the temple. And he taught, saying to them, Is not written, my house shall be called the house of what? I love you guys praying in the mornings. For all the nations, for all the nations. Uh, BJ, be encouraged for the, at least all the cities we can in our area. And wonderful. But you have made it a den of what? And basically what that saying is, don't rip God's people off. Could be in the church, anywhere. Anywhere, don't rip. Give people a deal. I like deals. My wife loves deals. I call her the coupon queen. I even wrote her to Diddy. My wife, Linda, the coupon queen. Amen. Cuts more coupons than you ever seen. Stop right there and let's go right on. <coughs> Are you with me? Excuse me. All right. Now listen, verse 16, look what the scribes and the high priests do. Remember, Jesus has to be examined by the people and the high priests, okay? And we're going to see this right here. It says, and the scribes and the chief priests heard of it, sought how they might destroy him. See, now the plotting begins. Now they're starting to plot. Before they were watching, now they're plotting. Just like your religious friends. <laughs> they were watching you. Now they might be mad at you because you're so holier than thou. No, just kidding with you. All right, look. look. I love this. Okay, so watch. Okay. And because the people were astonished as his teaching, and when evening had come, he went out to the city. Church, 
Are we using God's house for prayer and for the word we are? Now, we do have a few Bibles we give away, and there's some things if you want to get. In fact, there's one guy I want, want him to get Bible. If get it, get it through my wife, he can save some money because of the volume we order. But anyway, past that. You see, the house of God needs to be a supply chamber. It needs to be a, a supply depot, a training place, a gas station. In other words, a place to fill up and be encouraged. Say amen. The preacher or the teacher say, Pastor Gary, my job is not to beat you down, make you feel guilty. No, my job is to build you up, encourage you. Now, that's why everybody, and don't, again, don't write me a letter. That's why people get mad at Joel Olstein. Joel was not a preacher preacher. He was an encourager. Now, if God didn't love him, bless him, that church wouldn't be huge. And you can sit and criticize his message, but I think everybody thinks he should be one way when God wants him another. And, you know, people can do that with you. They can think you should be doing this instead of what you're doing. That's none of their business. That's God's business. You aren't... We God's child. So I would suggest what God warned us to do is leave God's people alone. Even if you see something you don't like, don't make them a part of your conversation. And if you do, by, by chance, switch it up. Oh, wonderful persons saved a lot of souls. Then change the subject. Say amen. Don't drone on and drone on. One of the ways that Satan knows when to attack us is your droning on and negativity over and over again. Nothing works. You complain about this. You complain about that. So immediately you got a piece of steak matted to your face and the dogs are right there. Stop the negativity. If you got something coming out of your mouth, either praise the Lord or go, Wah! say Amen. Don't dribble on and talk about things you really can't change because what it does is it gives fodder for the devil to use against you. And I tell you what, he, he tries enough as it is. Remember, he comes to you and he tempts you to get you to punch at the kingdom iniquity so he can legally punch back. That's why Jesus said when somebody slaps you on the cheek, turn to him the other cheek. He wasn't talking about physical it says, when the enemy reaches out to use somebody to slap at you, don't interact and slap back. Just back off and let God do the wisdom, do the fighting. Say amen. Boy, that was worth a million bucks right there. Because we always want to get involved in the fight. And that's where we get injured. Because I'm going to say this to you, little wisdom from God. You get injured in direct volume or where you shouldn't be. So if you got your arm out where it shouldn't be and your arm gets injured, how come the rest of me I didn't get injured? Because only your arm was out. And Jesus said, if your arm offends you, what? Pluck it off or cut it off. I'm going to explain. And if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Now, what he's talking about, spiritual eyes and arms. It'd be awful to have a pile of those around, Linda. <laughs> hey, what's that in my lawn? Everybody's arms and eyes, <laughs> plucking them out. No, he's talking about what do your eyes do? See, so if all you can see is negativity, it'd be better to pluck them out. How about you? Is all you can see is people's faults and negativity? Here's a just thought. How about your hands? Do you find yourself doing things you really shouldn't do? Then it says pluck out your spiritual. What do hands do? Hands do things. What does your, your spiritual hand do? It has, helps you help. So if you found your helping is not doing anything, then it's like the branch. Cut it off. Or cut it back so it bears much more fruit. Say amen. Everyone, thank God I'm not talking about you. Amen. <laughs> it's the real way things are. We want God to make us the champions he designed for us to be. In order for that to happen, we have to meet with him faithfully. We have to allow him to do all the trimming and the cutting. In this church, I say my prayers for the church, and then I say, Lord, this is your work, except the Lord build the house, those that labor, labor in vain. So, Lord, you build the house, you bring who you want, you add to it as you would see. But, Lord God, because if I start doing it, gonna, there's going to be something there. My heart's right about it, your heart's right about it. So we want God to build the house. Say amen. All right, 
look all the way down. Look at verse 20 and 21 now. In the same point, the fig tree. Mark 11, 20 and 21. It says, now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree. Now remember, this is a type and shadow of Israel. Dried up from the roots. Ooh, ooh. And Peter, remembering what he said, Rabbi, teacher, look, the fig tree which you have cursed is withered away. Now, folks, there's a thing called the curse of the law. Everyone say curse of the law. And back in the Old Testament, it had a blessing and a cursing. So if you obeyed the law, you were blessed. If you disobeyed the law, you were cursed. Aren't you glad we're in the New Testament? Because none of them could obey the law all the time. And that's why all these dove sacrifices and salt sacrifices, because they'd be blowing it all week long. Now, again, I'm not picking on the Jews. I'm just telling you the system was flawed. Who was the flaw? Let me say, what was the flaw of the Old Testament Old Covenant? Do you know? Most people don't. Man. A covenant is between two people, God and man, right? But who's the flawed one? Come on, man. So guess what? When you see the law, what the law could not do, even though it was weak in the flesh, God did by his sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, yet without sin, condemning sin in the flesh. Now, those who walk in the Spirit are not condemned, but we are free. Can you say amen? So the choices we make. So we can see ourselves coming in to Jesus because Jesus sees the whole picture how what he's going to do for all of us throughout the rest of eternity until the time of grace is over with, the church age. Hallelujah. Let's go to this next point. Jesus, his authority was questioned. Now, who was at this time? This is the Old Testament, right? The, Old, the New Testament was not in power until Jesus rose from the dead and Pentecost came into operation. Then the New Testament, the age of grace came into power, new covenant, say amen. But Jesus was still in the Old Testament. So he's relating an Old Testament understanding. It's important that you get this. All right, so he goes on and he says, Mark 11, verse 27 through 28. Jesus is being questioned, and who's behind these people questioning Jesus? The devil. The devil is. The devil will put people up to things. Hello. Look at Judas. Oh, Jesus loved Judas so much. You see, the ones that, that Jesus loves, his love transcends into our ugliness, you see. And even at the time that Judas was going to go and sell Jesus out with a kiss, Jesus washed his feet still. Oh, that we'd be, be like Jesus with wisdom and know what we're doing with God. Say amen. I didn't say wash your enemy's feet all the time either. All right. So it goes on and it says in verse 27, first authority... The first questioning of authority of Jesus. Then they came again to Jerusalem. Remember, they're really ticked. He cleaned out the temple. And he said, he was walking in the temple, and the chief priests and the scribes, who? The chief priests, they have to, and the scribes. Scribes were holy secretaries. They jotted everything down that they saw. It was like taking notes. They looked just like them, had robes and everything, but they were writing everything down. That's a scribe. Can you say amen? And the scribes were over-opinionated, especially with the religious bunch. They had their favorite priests they'd follow around. Moving past all of that, and he says, and they came again to Jerusalem, and was walking in the temple, and the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, by what authority? Are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? Now, what they're trying to get him to say something blasphemous, something they can accuse him. But we know whose authority, his father's authority, their father's authority. They sent Jesus. Can you say amen? And he fulfilled all that's written of him, Hebrews 10, verse 5. But within all of that, they're questioning because they're supposed to be 
the godly representatives in the earth. Can you say amen? But you can tell Satan's take, taken over the religion, and now they're accusing the Savior of the world. I can just sit back, I can sit back and imagine our Father going, yep, keep on stepping, a couple more feet, and you're going to step right into the trap. Now, from our observation, oh, the whole thing, whoa, man. But from God's observation, <laughs> that'll be it for the enemy. So you must know at this time that Satan is already sentenced to hell. He already has a curse. Now, listen, let me explain. He already has a curse on him. So when you and I allow our flesh to do what he suggests, that little bit of that curse gets on us. You don't want that. That's called the filthiness of the flesh. So you take that in your prayer life and get rid of that filthiness. All the time you have to flick it off because it wants to come. Hello, it's like washing your hands. No big deal. Don't make a big deal out of it. Grow into the Lord. Can you say amen? So his whole system is to get us filthy. Our system is to stay below, behind our heads under the light. Can you say amen? Well, watch this. This is something you need to understand. So they're accusing him. And they get more strategic in their accusation. Amen. Of course, we knew who sent Jesus. Now, who sent you? You got born again, right? Write down John 1.12. That tells you now that you're born again, you have authority to be children of God. That means you're God's son and daughter. Now, I don't know about you. You don't tick off or hurt God's sons and daughters because you're going to get God really upset. And that's what we see going on here. You see judgment in America, judgment in some other things, the world going crazy. Now, listen, I'm going to tell you, write this down if you have to. It's because of their treatment of the Jews and Christians, of Jesus Christ. What do you mean? Every war, every rumor of war, every fight, everything, all these people are doing all this because do they love God? No, they rejected him. So who's now their God? The God of war? Hello? The evil one? The one that turns one person against the other. What's Satan's greatest tool? Is get you offended and turn one thing against another. Constantly opposing yourself. A double-minded man or woman is unstable in all their ways. They can't even receive anything from the Lord because they're opposed. They're doing this. And that's why enemy wants us talking about things we can't change, but we only should be praying about. Say amen. We should be praying about them, not talking about them. Because talking ta about things that are broken too much gives more brokenness permission to the enemy. And so I don't want to give the devil a hammer to whack me with it. Do you? Now, I'm not preaching right at you. I'm just trying to show us that all of us, we have to trim some of those loose ends. I'm, I'm going to use you, Scott. You work on machines. Tell me how dangerous it is to have things flopping off your shirt and you're working in machines. Get caught in those machines, you know, and can get really hurt. Hello? So, Christians, look at today. We have a lot of Christians that are in name only. Are they leaves? Have no fruit? So, the thing we need to do, because we love God and God loves us, is, Lord, help me to produce more fruit. Say amen. And he will. It'll be God fruit. Fruit that never stops producing. He that does the will of God continues in the law of liberty. He doesn't forget. He will be blessed in what he does. James. All right. Are you getting anything out of this? All right. So M Matthew chapter 12, we're going to move over a little chapter. Verse 13 through 15. Here we see. Jesus is being accused about his taxes. I got the hiccups now. Jesus, do you pay taxes? People still today argue over that. Listen, if you pay in taxes, do something that maybe you didn't think of. When you do it, and you get to write that check out, however you pay it, instant transfer, Put your hand on it, saying, Lord, I'm giving this freely with your blessing. 
and I'm believing for a return. Why not? Now you brought God's blessing on it. Because some people, let's be honest, Ugh, tax time. And immediately their eyes slip down from expectancy and being, I'm not talking about silly happy, but being content in God, slipping down on, oh, there we go. Are we giving the enemy something to us about? Hello? Good thought. Moving right along. How many, hey, you got your prophet rocks there, BJ? You about ready to throw a prophet rock at me? It's, it's a joke. I'll tell you later. Amen. It's a good thing. We used to sit on the front pews when we go to services and we'd have our prophet rock. It was a sponge rock that looked like our, my football up here, kind of spongy, you know. Spongy, Mike. You know, and um, it looked like it, we were going to toss it. And actually, a couple of guys I tossed them out. So it was the Randall brothers and several people in my church. So we'd go around and we'd say, now, if you get out of line, we're going to toss some rocks at you. You know, did you know the Jewish people, if they didn't like you and they labeled you something, they threw rocks at you? That's, what, that's the whole thing. All right, so moving right along. You ready? Okay, I haven't lost any of you. Good. Mark 12, look what it says. Then they, see to, they said to him, and some of them were Pharisees and Herodians. Let me say, I have a little joke about Pharisees and Sadducees. But do you know who a Herodian is? Anybody here not? Come on, it's okay. Who were the Herodians? There were the Hellenistic Jews. What? They were the Greek Jews. Greek Jews. Hellenistic Jews. Remember? Hellenist of Troy. Okay, and so they held fast to their sect, but they became Jews. So they were Henri. They were the intellectuals. Okay, so the Pharisees, I love this, because it's Palm Sunday. So Pharisees are the ones that keep adding rules. Let's say we, we jo Scott and I joined the Cub Scouts, and we were leaders. But now they like, we've got it, what we're doing, it's running really, really good. And now... Some people hand us some more rules to obey. This says, no, you can't do it that way. You have to do it this way. The Pharisees were notorious of piling extra rules and regulations on people's belief system to where they were burdened down. Jesus addressed it. He says, you lay heavy burdens on people, but you don't obey them yourself. That was a Pharisee, okay? And they believed in resurrection. They believed in angels, that's why they were fair, you see. Okay? Let's go right on. Okay. But they were talking to him, trying to get him involved in taxes. Why? Because they were under the Roman rule. Where do taxes go? They go to Rome. So if they could say, oh, Jesus is not paying his taxes, boom. Okay. Just so you know, these events are very important, even though sometimes we brisk over them. They were trying to entrap Jesus. Now listen, what was the prophecy in Genesis 3.15? That the devil would try to bruise your heel, right? You would crush his head, but he would try to get something on you. Huh? Amen. Now this is the, why I don't run for public office. Somebody out there will try to get something on me. I'd rather avoid it and just die to myself and become a Christian. Can you say Amen. Believe me, I have a lot of skeletons in there somewhere. But half of Jesus doesn't know any of them, and I don't remember anymore. And I'm not certainly going to bring up anybody's hurts or pains. And I know enough government secrets that I'm pretty dangerous. But I'm not going to just tell you everything. I'll tell you what you need to know with your Christianity. But I want to let you know the Antichrist has pretty much set his system all up. Hello. And the bark of the beast is already being readied. But remember, just before all that comes into full function and operation, there has to be two things. The people who don't know God have to become like animals. <laughs> Pretty close. I mean like animals. Filthy and nasty. Lovers themselves. Covetous, proud, disrespectful. You know, this whole thing is listed. And the godly people will become holier because God has to get, if I have to say, he has to get his bride ready. 
And in order for us to get ready, God doesn't make us get ready. We have to go to him and get ready. We have to go to the dressing room. You have to go to the dressing room. What is God telling every Christian right now? Go to God. He's calling you. Stop making excuses. You're half-dressed, an easy target. Go to God daily and let him dress you. And he'll add jewels and sparkles to you each time as he cleans us up from the inside and we metamorphosize and we become that beautiful butterfly. Say amen. <laughs> Happy Palm Sunday. Oh, by the way, you do have palms. Raise them to God. <laughs> Amen. Ah, oh, I done preached myself happy. You didn't think I was mad at you, did you? I just want to let you know that look where the church, God is getting this whole church going. The whole, everywhere, churches are now going back to prayer. Friday night prayer meetings and things are all being, the fire is coming. It's okay. Don't get your eyes still up. Don't put your eyes on what's going on. Peek once in a while. But don't keep focused on the things you don't need or the things that don't minister to you. Hello? Be wise as a serpent. You got your hand into doo-doo? Wash them. Say amen. So the challenge again. Jesus, do you pay your taxes? And he, of course, we know. I'm just cutting it short. Render unto Caesar what Caesar's and what is God is God. Say amen. Isn't that our life? So listen, obey the laws of the land. Don't go out there and be breaking laws. And this is why God doesn't want Christians protesting and screaming and acting like the world, because we're punching physically into the darkness, and the darkness is going to punch on the back. We don't fight the enemy that way, as one who beats the air. We release Jesus with the words of our mouth, and God's system takes over. Say amen. You see, angels listen unto the voice of the word. Everyone say, angels listen unto God's voice. Don't they? So put your Bible right up to your ear. Do you hear anything? No, you have to speak God's word to give God's word voice. When you do, your angels go to work. When you speak about the world and what's wrong, what isn't, what is, your angels stop. They need the word like gasoline. No gassy, no goey. So the more you speak the word, the more your angelic forces get to going. Start speaking it more. You know what I did years ago? Can I tell you a quick story? I, I found out that if my words can release God and his angels, I'm not ordering angels what to do, but I'm getting them active and busy. I said, well, I know what I'll do. I have a, a recorded loop tape on my phone that records a loop. There must be larger loops where I can record a prayer on a loop tape. So I just hit the button, and that prayer continually prays while I go off and pray in other directions. God gave me that. He says, yes, yeah, son, but you take another one of them and stick it over here, and you play the original tape, you record it, and then you record what you're praying. Now it's got three to four recordings of prayer on it. Now you switch it over back over here and you do it again, do it again, do it again. Now you've got all these prayers and proclamations going out into the airwaves. Why would I need to do that? Because it cuts Satan's power out of the air. Then put it somewhere and plug it in and let it play and never stop it. You, meanwhile, pray about what God directs you and, and guides you in, but now you've got a prayer battery going on. So you, we might not be able to do that. Maybe Danny can do that. The thing. But the idea is that God gave me that idea because at that time, we needed to drive the enemy back. So I sold the idea to my friend down there in Livermore, California. He was the head of the Full Gospel Businessman Fellowship, and his son actually took on the name Joy of the Lord Fellowship and started a church in our honor down there some years back. Anyway, I took him, shared the idea with them, and then a year later, I came back to do some preaching and teaching at the church in the Full Gospel Business Fellowship. And I came back, and, and uh, Don says to me, Carrie, I want to play something for you. 
I said, what is it? Because I, you know, I got, got him started on the idea. He says, you work on it, see what you can come up with, God. Remember, God gives us witty ideas, things to do, not only spiritually, physically, mentally. Can you say amen? And, I, and so he, I get in his car, and he says, listen to this. And he pushes the tape, and I hear all this water. Like voices of many waters. Like voices of many waters. You know that's in Revelation. He has a voice of many waters. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Hello? Well springs of water springing up. Did you know you're connected to them? Anyway, I sat there. I said, what's that? He says, we got a whole bunch of people praying, and we recorded over a recording, over a recording, over a recording when you could do that, over a recording. He says, there's probably a 1,000 hours of prayers stuck on this little tape, only 30 seconds long. So all you're hearing is what's like water. But what I want to tell you, in the spirit realm, God needs to hear us speak his word, to speak his spirit out. Why? Because that's what he listens to. He he doesn't listen to complaints. He notarizes them, but he needs us to give him something he can work with. Say amen. You didn't get God in your heart until you ask God to come in your heart, right? You're not going to get God into your family until you bombard and tell God, I need you in my family, especially that honorary one right there. You get him, I place him in your hands, and now I take my hands off so you can work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Say amen, somebody. So Jesus was being challenged because Satan was going to get his head crushed. And he says, this might be the dude. So he's using, remember, he already came to Jesus. Didn't Satan come to Jesus? In the temptations. Already challenged him. He failed. So I told you, he'll come first directly and if he can't anymore, come directly, because most of you can't come directly on you anymore. He has to send someone. Smile up at me. So he sent the religious people. Folks, it's usually the religious people. People who think that they're holier. Now, I'm not putting everything down. But they get the flesh idea of, we're cool and nobody else is. And they're attacking Jesus with that. And, of course, eventually crucify him which is the ultimate trap of God. Say amen. Are you getting anything? Almost done. Woohoo! All right. I better drink some more of this. Okay. Jesus was challenged by all these different sects. Let me give you one. First, the priests and the scribes. He had to be examined by the priests and the scribes. Second, the Pharisees and the Herodians, Greek Jews. Third, by the Sadducees. Everyone say Sadducees. You'll find that in Mark 12, 18. Now I like to talk about the Sadducees. How many here know what a Sadducee is? Not really. It's a sect of Jewish belief that did not believe in angels. They did not believe in a resurrection. They are what we call the olden days Jehovah Witness. Because the Jehovah Witnesses don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. See, Sadducees, that's why they were Sadducee, didn't believe in anything paranormal or supernatural. How many know our God's supernatural? Parting Red Seas, great big fish swallowing Jonah, huh? Jesus doing all kinds of water into wine. Very, very supernatural God we serve. So don't throw all supernatural things out. Just remember the guided line. All good and perfect comes from, and everything else you have to discern. Good and perfect comes from, everything else you have to look at with Jesus' eyes to discern it. Why? Because you don't want to eat poison. If God tells you not to do it, you did it, now you got a broken leg? Was that God? No. Hang around here, we'll teach you. I notice, though, enemies does his work. Listen, if you know you're going to go to church Sunday, Saturdays, the Sabbath, (laughs) you're going to go to Bible study, prepare a little bit. Don't you think the enemy wants to keep people from knowing things? Well, help me. I need your prayers. I need your counsel. I need you to encourage young people. God comes first. Hello? Jobs third. 
goes God, then your family, and then your job. In my case, my job is my ministry, my, my ministry, my job. But it goes God first, family second, okay, job or ministry with me third, or job and then what you do at church. Remember, you don't live at the church like Linda and I do. So you can't, I don't expect you to be here every day and be living and breathing church. But I expect you to be here when you're supposed to. Hello. There you go. So therefore, measure your life out and make room for God. Don't live on the cusp. Okay? I did that. I had three kids, lost one, full ministry, wife, all this going on, everything. Church is getting four, 500 people. And I collapsed from the inside out. I don't recommend that for anybody. You need to pressurize as you go through your days. God is making you stronger within to help face what God and what the future holds for you. Say amen. But there is somebody who doesn't want to get you in the future. He wants to stop you right now. That's where you knock and push the door open in Jesus' name. All right, and finish him with us. Last point, from Israel to all the world. Go with me to Matthew 13. We're going to see where Jesus actually changes his ministry. Some people see this. Some people don't see this. But you need to understand that Jesus was called to all the world. But he said to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Jew first because of them giving birth to him. I'm going to honor my parent nation. The one I raised and made, then birthed and brought me forth. I'm going to go to them and see if they'll accept me. And if they don't accept me, then I'm going to carry it into the world anyway. Did you get that? You'll find that in Romans. I think it's the ninth chapter. Because the Israel's not loving God. They, God turned to the favor of the Israelites. His purpose and plan all the time. Everyone say there's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond, nor free, male, nor female, but we are all, all one in Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? Therefore, we know no man after the flesh anymore. We have known the Lord after the flesh, but now he's gone. So we don't know him like that anymore. We are to know each other in the spirit. I see the spiritual God. I see the spiritual person in you. You see what I mean? The Jesus operating in you. And if I see something in your life that is going to hinder the Jesus growing in you, I'm going to suggest a few things. I'm not mad at you, but I'd rather have you not be stagnized in your growth. Say amen. Christians today, they'll, some of them have wonderful faith, but their life is atrocious. Some people can, they just, remember, there's a difference between somebody who's gifted by God and somebody who pleased by God. Okay, it's different. Some people have a gift, and they hardly even love God, but the gift operates. You need to know and recognize. Don't model yourself after somebody like that because their life is atrocious, but the gift works because the gift came from what? God. So what do we do? We try to match our life with the gift. Can you say amen? And live before God in love. Okay, I've got to quit talking. Let's look at this. Matthew chapter 13, look at 1 through 3, tells us he went from the house to the sea. And on the same day after Israel treated him rude, he went out from the house and sat by the sea, the house of Israel, the sea of the Gentiles. And great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got in a boat and he sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore and he spoke to them many things to them in parables, hidden stories. Behold, a sower went out to sow. First, in this phrase, he's talking about himself. The sower went out to sow. Listen to me. Folks, you're in a wonderful church, but there are other wonderful churches. If the congregations don't pay attention, they'll never grow. And you'll grow weary of me. Because I'll be telling you, do this, and you're not doing that. So the next time I suggest you do this, you're going to get more resentful and maybe not do that. And then if I suggest it again, you might even get huffy. Jesus went to Peter, didn't he? He said, Peter, do you love me? He said, well, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Well, Lord, 
you know I'm, I, I'm your friend. Because the second time, it's I'm your friend, not just love you. And, and Jesus, Peter, do you love me? The second time, he says, do you love me the way I love you? I died for you, Peter. I gave up my life for you. It isn't about selfishness anymore, Peter. And Peter got upset, remember? God comes to us all the time, and he appeals to us. You might be out somewhere in a wilderness, and he'll call to you. Hagar, what are you doing out there? Huh? Elijah, what are you doing under a juniper bush? How, how come you're hanging out in a cave? Sometimes we want to shield ourselves because we feel inadequate. But listen, you've got God on the inside. Let me encourage you from this point on. Jesus is entering in to take care of all of us. He's going to specifically deal with things. Very important for the Israelites and for us. But listen, the Bible says you and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? We need to let God into every room of our temple, into the way we think, to the way we speak. We need to bring God into the areas of our families, our loved ones, our community. Some of you live in a community where you can touch and reach your neighbors, like such as a, 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 a motel or not a motel, whatever it's called. Apartments. There we go. Hello. Anyway, our job is to reach out because we have to have three things. And then I'm going to leave you with this. We have to have a healthy upreach to God. Say amen. And I can tell you people like Melinda and others who pray a lot, even though they've seen or been things that have been challenging them, they're not moved as easy as people that just have head knowledge. Don't have head knowledge only. Have heart knowledge through prayer. Say amen. All right. And so, let's finish up. I'm going to try to tail this thing down together. Okay, finally in Matthew 13, he says, and he answered, his disciples came to him and said, how come you're speaking to everybody in parables? Now, do you know why God spoke in parables? Do you, do you actually know Why? Because only when you speak in parables, only the curious will look further. You'll separate those who are being religious from those who really want to know. I've done it a lot, but I'm very poor at it. Hello? You know, you can look at the prophet Samuel came to David, and he talked about somebody stealing a sheep and then killed the sheep owner and did all this. And he said, what should be done to this? And David says, that man should be murdered. And he says... David, you're that man. You stole somebody and you had him murdered. You see, so that's a parable. It doesn't come right to the point, but if you really look further, God will reveal it to you. Say amen. It's been given unto us to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but unto those without, it says, it has not been given. So seeing, they don't see, and hearing, they hear, but they don't hear. Lest they turn with their hearts understand with their heads and repent and I can heal them. How many know it wasn't until you said, Lord, I need you in my heart that God healed, started working on you. Say amen. And then finishing. Woohoo! All right. He says, now listen, now that you have Jesus, this is the scripture. Verse 12, Matthew 13 says, for whosoever has, to him more will be given. Say, I have Jesus. And he will have an abundance. But whoever doesn't have Jesus, even what he thinks or she thinks she has, who's the thief in the Bible? He will come and steal it away. Who's the major ripoff in the world? Who teaches all the other ripoffs in the world? Satan does. Come on, there's only two kingdoms working. There's God's kingdom and, and Satan's kingdom. And we're a pawn. We can lean one way or the other if we're not careful. How many here are sold out to God? Would you give the Lord a hand clap if you got something out of that? Amen. Happy